to The Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf Part 2. Time Passes. Chapter 1. Well, we must wait for the future to show, said Mr. Banks, coming in from the terrace. It's almost too dark to see, said Andrew, coming up from the beach. One can hardly tell which is the sea and which is the land, said Prue. Do we leave that light burning? said Lily as they took their coats off indoors. No, said Prue, not if everyone's in. Andrew, she called back, just put out the light in the hall. One by one the lamps were all extinguished, except that Mr. Carmichael, who liked to lie awake a little reading Virgil, kept his candle burning rather longer than the rest. End of Chapter 1 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 2 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. So with the lamps all put out, the moon sunk, and a thin rain drumming on the roof a downpouring of immense darkness began. Nothing, it seemed, could survive the flood, the profusion of darkness which, creeping in at keyholes and crevices, stole round window blinds, came into bedrooms, swallowed up here a jug and basin, there a bowl of red and yellow dahlias there a sharp cheese and from bulko fascist off drawers. Not only was furniture confounded. There was scarcely anything left of body or mind by which one could say, this is he or this is she. Sometimes a hand was raised as if to clutch something or ward off something, or somebody groaned, or somebody laughed aloud as if sharing a joke with nothingness. Nothing stirred in the drawing room or in the dining room or on the staircase. Only through the rusty hinges and swollen sea moistened woodwork certain airs, detached from the body of the wind, the house was ramshackle after all, crept round corners and ventured indoors. Almost one might imagine them, as they entered the drawing room questioning and wondering, toying with the flap of hanging wallpaper, asking, would it hang much longer, when would it fall? Then smoothly brushing the walls, they passed on musingly as if asking the red and yellow roses on the wallpaper whether they would fade, and questioning, gently, for there was time at their disposal, the torn letters in the waste paper basket the flowers the books all of which were now apento them and asking, were they allies? Were they enemies? How long would they endure? So some random light directing them with its pale footfall upon stair and mat, from some uncovered star, or wandering ship, or the lighthouse even, with its pale footfall upon stair and mat, the little heirs mounted the staircase and nosed round bedroom doors. But here surely, they must cease. Whatever else may perish and disappear, what lies here is steadfast. Here one might say to those sliding lights, those fumbling airs that breathe and bend over the bed itself, here you can neither touch nor destroy. Upon which, wearily, ghostlily, as if they had feather-light fingers and the light persistency of feathers, they would look, once, on the shut eyes, and the loosely clasping fingers, and fold their garments wearily and disappear. And so, nosing, rubbing, they went to the window on the staircase, to the servants' bedrooms, to the boxes in the attics. Descending, blanched the apples on the dining room table, fumbled the petals of roses, tried the picture on the easel, brushed the mat and blew a little sand along the floor. At length, desisting, all ceased together, gathered together, all sighed together. All together gave off an aimless gust of lamentation to which some door in the kitchen replied. Swung wide. Admitted nothing. And slammed to. Here Mr. Carmichael, who was reading Virgil, blew out his candle. It was past midnight. End of Chapter 2 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 3 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. But what after all is one night? A short space, especially when the darkness dims so soon, and so soon a bird sings, a cock crows, or a faint green quickens, like a turning leaf, in the hollow of the wave. Night, however, succeeds to night. The winter holds a pack of them in store and deals them equally, evenly, with indefatigable fingers. They lengthen. They darken. Some of them hold aloft clear planets, plates of brightness. The autumn trees, ravaged as they are, 
take on the flash of tattered flags kindling in the gloom of cool cathedral caves where gold letters on marble pages describe death in battle and how bones bleach and burn far away in Indian sands. The autumn trees gleam in the yellow moonlight, in the light of harvest moons, the light which mellows the energy of labor, and smooths the stubble, and brings the wave lapping blue to the shore. It seemed now as if, touched by human penitence and all its toil, divine goodness had parted the curtain and displayed behind it, single, distinct, the hair erect. The wave falling. The boat rocking. Which, did we deserve them, should be ours always. But alas, divine goodness, twitching the cord, draws the curtain. It does not please him. He covers his treasures in a drench of hail, and so breaks them, so confuses them that it seems impossible that their calm should ever return or that we should ever compose from their fragments a perfect whole or read in the littered pieces the clear words of truth. For our penitence deserves a glimpse only. Our toil respite only. The nights now are full of wind and destruction. The trees plunge and bend and their leaves fly helter-skelter until the lawn is plastered with them and they lie packed in gutters and choke rain pipes and scatter damp paths. Also the sea tosses itself and breaks itself, and should any sleeper fancying the thee might find on the beach an answer to his doubts, a sharer of his solitude, throw off his bedclothes and go down by himself to walk on the sand, no image with semblance of serving and divine promptitude comes readily to hand bringing the night to order and making the world reflect the compass of the soul. The hand dwindles in his hand. The voice bellows in his ear. Almost it would appear that it is useless in such confusion to ask the night those questions as to what, and why, and wherefore, which tempt the sleeper from his bed to seek an answer. Mr. Ramsey, stumbling along a passage one dark morning, stretched his arms out, but Mrs. Ramsey having died rather suddenly the night before, his arms, though stretched out, remained empty. End of Chapter 3 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf Chapter 4 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. So with the house empty and the doors locked and the mattresses rolled round, those stray heirs, advance guards of great armies, blustered in, brushed bare boards, nibbled and fanned, met nothing in bedroom or drawing room that wholly resisted them but only hangings that flapped, wood that creaked, the bare legs of tables, saucepans and china already furred, tarnished, cracked. What people had shed and left a pair of shoes, a shooting cap, some faded skirts and coats in wardrobes those alone kept the human shape and in the emptiness indicated how once they were filled and animated. How once hands were busy with hooks and buttons. How once the looking glass had held a face. Had held a world hollowed out in which a figure turned, a hand flashed, the door opened, in came children rushing and tumbling. And went out again. Now. Day after day, light turned, like a flower reflected in water, its sharp image on the wall opposite. Only the shadows of the trees, flourishing in the wind, made obeisance on the wall, and for a moment darkened the pool in which light reflected itself. Or birds, flying, made a soft spot flutter slowly across the bedroom floor. So loveliness reigned and stillness, and together made the shape of loveliness itself, a form from which life had parted. Solitary like a pool at evening, far distant, seen from a train window, vanishing so quickly that the pool, pale in the evening, is scarcely robbed of its solitude, though once seen. Loveliness and stillness clasped hands in the bedroom, and among the shrouded jugs and sheeted chairs even the prying of the wind, and the soft nose of the clammy sea airs, rubbing, snuffling, iterating, and reiterating their questions will you fade? Will you perish? Scarcely disturbed the peace, the indifference, the air of pure integrity as if that question the asked scarcely need it hath they should answer, we remain. Nothing it seemed could break that image, corrupt that innocence, or disturb the swaying mantle of silence which, week after week, in the empty room, wove into itself the falling cries of birds, ships hooting, the drone and hum of the fields, a dog's bark, a man's shout, and folded them round the house in silence. Once only a board sprang on the landing. Once in the middle of the night with a roar, with a rupture, as after centuries of quiescence, 
a rock rends itself from the mountain and hurdles crashing into the valley, one fold of the shawl loosened and swung to and fro. Then again peace descended. And the shadow wavered. Light bent to its own image in adoration on the bedroom wall. And Mrs. McNabb, tearing the veil of silence with hands that had stood in the wash tub, grinding it with boots that had crunched the shingle, came as directed to open all windows, and dust the bedrooms. End of Chapter 4 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 5 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. As she lurched, for she rolled like a ship at sea, and leered, for her eyes fell on nothing directly, but with a sidelong glance that deprecated the scorn and anger of the world she was witless, she knew it, as she clutched the banisters and hauled herself upstairs and rolled from room to room, she sang. Rubbing the glass of the long looking glass and leering sideways at her swinging figure a sound issued from her lips something that had been gay twenty years before on the stage perhaps, had been hummed and danced to, but now, coming from the toothless, bonnet, caretaking woman, was robbed of meaning, was like the voice of witlessness, humor, persistency itself, trodden down but springing up again, so that as she lurched, dusting, wiping, she seemed to say how it was one long sorrow and trouble, how it was getting up and going to bed again, and bringing things out and putting them away again. It was not easy or snug this world she had known for close on seventy years. Bowed down she was with weariness. How long, she asked, creaking and groaning on her knees under the bed, dusting the boards, how long shall it endure? But hobbled to her feet again, pulled herself up, and again with her sidelong leer which slipped and turned aside even from her own face, and her own sorrows, stood and gaped in the glass, aimlessly smiling, and began again the old amble and hobble, taking up mats, putting down china, looking sideways in the glass, as if, after all, she had her consolations, as if indeed there twined about her dirge some incorrigible hope. Visions of joy there must have been at the wash tub, say with her children, yet two had been baseborn and one had deserted her, at the public house, drinking. Turning over scraps in her drawers. Some cleavage of the dark there must have been, some channel in the depths of obscurity through which light enough issued to twist her face grinning in the glass and make her, turning to her job again, mumble out the old music hall song. The mystic, the visionary, walking the beach on a fine night, stirring a puddle, looking at a stone, asking themselves what am I, what is this? Had suddenly an answer vouchsafed them, they could not say what it was, so that they were warm in the frost and had comfort in the desert. But Mrs. McNabb continued to drink and gossip as before. End of Chapter 5 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 6 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. The spring without a leaf to toss, bare and bright like a virgin fierce in her chastity, scornful in her purity, was laid out on fields wide-eyed and watchful and entirely careless of what was done or thought by the beholders. Prue Ramsey, leaning on her father's arm, was given in marriage. What people said could have been more fitting. And they added, how beautiful she looked. As summer neared, as the evenings lengthened, there came to the wakeful, the hopeful, walking the beach, stirring the pool, imaginations of the strangest kind of flesh turned to atoms which drove before the wind, of stars flashing in their hearts, of cliff, sea, cloud, and sky brought purposely together to assemble outwardly the scattered parts of the vision within. In those mirrors, the minds of men, in those pools of uneasy water, in which clouds forever turn and shadows form, dreams persisted, and it was impossible to resist the strange intimation which every gull, flower, tree, man, and woman, and the white earth itself seemed to declare, but if questioned at once to withdraw, that good triumphs, happiness prevails, order rules. Or to resist the extraordinary stimulus to range hither and thither in search of some absolute good, some crystal of intensity, remote from the known pleasures and familiar virtues, something gallantatha processus of domestic life single hard bright like a diamond in the sand, which would render the possessor secure. Moreover, softened and acquiescent, the spring with her bees humming and gnats dancing through her cloak about her, 
veiled her eyes, averted her head, and among passing shadows and flights of small rain seemed to have taken upon her a knowledge of the sorrows of mankind. Pru Ramsey died that summer in some illness connected with childbirth, which was indeed a tragedy, people said, everything, they said, had promised so well. And now in the heat of summer the wind sent its spies about the house again. Flies wove a web in the sunny rooms. Weeds that had grown close to the glass in the night tapped methodically at the window pane. When darkness fell, the stroke of the lighthouse, which had laid itself with such authority upon the carpet in the darkness, tracing its pattern, came now in the softer light of spring mixed with moonlight gliding gently as if it laid its caress and lingered steathily and looked and came lovingly again. But in the very lull of this loving caress, as the long stroke leaned upon the bed, the rock was rent asunder. Another fold of the shawl loosened. There it hung, and swayed. Through the short summer nights and the long summer days, when the empty room seemed to murmur with the echoes of the fields and the hum of flies, the long streamer waved gently, swayed aimlessly. While the sun so striped and barred the rooms and filled them with yellow haze that Mrs. McNabb, when she broke in and lurched about, dusting, sweeping, looked like a tropical fish oaring its way through sun-lanced waters. But slumber and sleep though it might there came later in the summer ominous sounds like the measured blows of hammers dulled on felt, which, with their repeated shocks still further loosened the shawl and cracked the teacups. Now and again some glass tinkled in the cupboard as if a giant voice had shrieked so loud in its agony that tumblers stood inside a cupboard vibrated too. Then again silence fell. And then, night after night, and sometimes in plain midday when the roses were bright and light turned on the wall its shape clearly there seemed to drop into the silence, this indifference, this integrity, the thud of something falling. A shell exploded. Twenty or thirty young men were blown up in France, among them Andrew Ramsey, whose death, mercifully, was instantaneous. At that season those who had gone down to pace the beach and ask of the sea and sky what message they reported or what vision they affirmed had to consider among the usual tokens of divine bounty the sunset on the sea, the pallor of dawn, the moon rising, fishing boats against the moon, and children making mud pies or pelting each other with handfuls of grass, something out of harmony with this jocundity and this serenity. There was the silent apparition of an ashen-colored ship for instance, come, gone. There was a purplish stain upon the bland surface of the sea as if something had boiled and bled, invisibly, beneath. This intrusion into a scene calculated to stir the most sublime reflections and lead to the most comfortable conclusions stayed their pacing. It was difficult blandly to overlook them. To abolish their significance in the landscape. To continue, as one walked by the sea, to marvel how beauty outside mirrored beauty within. Did nature supplement what man advanced? Did she complete what he began? With equal complacence she saw his misery, his meanness, and his torture. That dream, of sharing, completing, of finding in solitude on the beach an answer, was then but a reflection in a mirror, and the mirror itself was but the surface glassiness which forms in quiescence when the nobler powers sleep beneath. Impatient, despairing yet loath to go, for beauty offers her lures, has her consolations, to pace the beach was impossible. Contemplation was unendurable. The mirror was broken. Mr. Carmichael brought out a volume of poems that spring, which had an unexpected success. The war, people said, had revived their interest in poetry. End of Chapter 6 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 7 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Night after night, summer and winter, the torment of storms, the arrow-like stillness of fine, had there been anyone to listen, from the upper rooms of the empty house only gigantic chaos streaked with lightning could have been heard tumbling and tossing, as the winds and waves disp ord themselves like the amorphous bulks of leviathans whose brows are pierced by no light of reason, and mounted one on top of another, and lunged and plunged in the darkness or the daylight, for night and day. Month and year ran shapelessly together, in idiot games, until it seemed as if the universe were battling and tumbling, in brute confusion and wanton lust aimlessly by itself. In spring the garden urns, 
casually filled with wind-blown plants, were gay as ever. Violets came and daffodils. But the stillness and the brightness of the day were as strange as the chaos and tumult of night, with the trees standing there, and the flowers standing there, looking before them, looking up, yet beholding nothing, eyeless, and so terrible. End of Chapter 7 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 8 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Thinking no harm, for the family would not come, never again, some said, and the house would be sold at Michaelmas perhaps, Mrs. McNabb stooped and picked a bunch of flowers to take home with her. She laid them on the table while she dusted. She was fond of flowers. It was a pity to let them waste. Suppose the house were sold, she stood arms akimbo in front of the looking glass, it would want seeing to it would. There it had stood all these years without a soul in it. The books and things were moldy, for, what with the war and help being hard to get, the house had not been cleaned as she could have wished. It was beyond one person's strength to get it straight now. She was too old. Her legs pained her. All those books needed to be laid out on the grass in the sun. There was plaster fallen in the hall. The rain pipe had blocked over the study window and let the water in. The carpet was ruined quite. But people should come themselves. They should have sent somebody down Tozy. For there were clothes in the cupboards. They had left clothes in all the bedrooms. What was she to do with them? They had the moth in them Mrs. Ramsay's things. Poor lady. She would never want them again. She was dead, they said. Years ago, in London. There was the old grey cloak she wore gardening, Mrs. McNabb fingered it. She could see her, as she came up the drive with the washing, stooping over her flowers, the garden was a pitiful sight now, all run to riot, and rabbits scuttling at you out of the beds, she could see her with one of the children by her in that grey cloak. There were boots and shoes. And a brush and comb left on the dressing table, for all the world as if she expected to come back tomorrow. She had died very sudden at the end, they said. And once they had been coming, but had put off coming, what with the war, and travel being so difficult these days. They had never come all these years. Just sent her money. But never wrote, never came, and expected to find things as they had left them, ah, dear. Why the dressing table drawers were full of things, she pulled them open, handkerchiefs, bits of ribbon. Yes, she could see Mrs. Ramsay as she came up the drive with the washing. Good evening, Mrs. McNabb, she would say. She had a pleasant way with her. The girls all liked her. But, dear, many things had changed since then, she shut the drawer. Many families had lost their dearest. So she was dead. And Mr. Andrew killed. And Miss Prue dead too, they said, with her first baby. But everyone had lost someone these years. Prices had gone up shamefully, and didn't come down again neither. She could well remember her in her grey cloak. Good evening, Mrs. McNabb, she said, and told Cook to keep a plate of milk soup for her quite thought she wanted it, carrying that heavy basket all the way up from town. She could see her now, stooping over her flowers. And faint and flickering, like a yellow beam or the circle at the end of a telescope a lady in agri cloak stood and cover her flowers went wandering over the bedroom wall, up the dressing table, across the washstand, as Mrs. McNabb hobbled and ambled, dusting, straightening. And Cook's name now? Mildred. Marion. Some name like that. Ah, she had forgotten she did forget things. Fiery, like all red-haired women. Many a laugh they had had. She was always welcome in the kitchen. She made them laugh, she did. Things were better than then now. She sighed. There was too much work for one woman. She wagged her head this side and that. This had been the nursery. Why, it was all damp in here. The plaster was falling. Whatever did they want to hang a beast's skull there? Gone moldy too and rats in all the attics. The rain came in. 
but they never sent. Never came. Some of the locks had gone, so the doors banged. She didn't like to be up here at dusk alone neither. It was too much for one woman, too much, too much. She creaked, she moaned. She banged at the door. She turned at the key and T-lock and left the house alone, shut up, locked. End of Chapter 8 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 9 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. The house was left. The house was deserted. It was left like a shell on a sand hill to fill with dry salt grains note that life I had lefty. The long good night seemed to have set in. The trifling airs, nibbling, the clammy breaths, fumbling, seemed to have triumphed. The saucepan had rusted and the mat decayed. Toads had nosed their way in. Idly, aimlessly, the swaying shawl swung to and fro. A thistle thrust itself between the tiles in the larder. The swallows nested in the drawing room. The floor was strewn with straw. The plaster fell in shovelfuls. Rafters were laid bare. Rats carried off this and that to gnaw behind the wainscots. Tortoise shell butterflies burst from the chrysalis and pattered their life out on the window pane. Poppies sewed themselves among the dahlias. The lawn waved with long grass. Giant artichokes towered among roses. A fringed carnation flowered among the cabbages. While the gentle tapping of a wheat at the window had become, on winter's nights, a drumming from sturdy trees and thorned briars which made the whole room green in summer. What power could now prevent the fertility, the insensibility of nature? Mrs. McNabb's dream of a lady, of a child, of a plate of milk soup. It had wavered over the walls like a spot of sunlight and vanished. She had locked the door. She had gone. It was beyond the strength of one woman, she said. They never sent. They never wrote. There were things up there rotting in the drawers it was a shame to leave them so, she said. The place was gone to rack and ruin. Only the lighthouse beam entered the rooms for a moment, sent its sudden stare over bed and wall in the darkness of winter, looked with equanimity at the thistle and the swallow, the rat, and the straw. Nothing now withstood them. Nothing said no to them. Let the wind blow. Let the poppy seed itself and the carnation mate with the cabbage. Let the swallow build in the drawing room, and the thistle thrust aside the tiles, and the butterfly sun itself on the faded chintz of the armchairs. Let the broken glass and the china lie out on the lawn and be tangled over with grass and wild berries. For now had come that moment, that hesitation when dawn trembles and night pauses, when if a feather alight in the scale it will be weighed down. One feather, and the house, sinking, falling, would have turned and pitched downwards to the depths of darkness. In the ruined room, picnickers would have lit their kettles. Lovers sought shelter there, lying on Thebra boards. And the shepherd stored his dinner on Thebricks and the tramp slept with his coat round him to ward off the cold. Then the roof would have fallen. Briars and hemlocks would have blotted out path, step, and window. Would have grown, unequally but lustily over the mound, until some trespasser, losing his way, could have told only by a red-hot poker among the nettles, or a scrap of china in the hemlock, that here once someone had lived. There had been a house. If the feather had fallen, if it had tipped the scale downwards, the whole house would have plunged to the depths to lie upon the sands of oblivion. But there was a force working. Something not highly conscious. Something that eared something that lurched. Something not inspired to go about its work with dignified ritual or solemn chanting. Mrs. McNabb groaned. Mrs. Bast creaked. They were old. They were stiff. Their legs ached. They came with their brooms and pails at last. They got to work. All of a sudden, would Mrs. McNabb see that the house was ready, one of the young ladies wrote, would she get this done? Would she get that done? All in a hurry. They might be coming for the summer. Had left everything to the last. Expected to find things as they had left them. Slowly and painfully, with broom and pail, mopping, scouring, Mrs. McNabb, Mrs. Bast, stayed the corruption and the rot. 
rescued from the pool of time that was fast closing over them now a basin, now a cupboard. Fetched up from oblivion all the Waverly novels and a tea set one morning. In the afternoon restored to sun and air a brass fender and a set of steel fire irons. George, Mrs. Bass's son, caught the rats, and cut the grass. They had the builders. Attended with the creaking of hinges and the screeching of bolts, the slamming and banging of damp swollen woodwork, some rusty laborious berth seemed to be taking place, as the women, stooping, rising, groaning, singing, slapped and slammed, upstairs now, now down in the cellars. Oh, they said, the work. They drank their tea in the bedroom sometimes, or in the study. Breaking off work at midday with the smudge on their faces, and their old hands clasped and cramped with the broom handles. Flopped on chairs, they contemplated now the magnificent conquest over taps and bath. Now the more arduous, more partial triumph over long rows of books, black as ravens once, now white-stained, breeding pale mushrooms and secreting furtive spiders. Once more, as she felt the tea warm in her, the telescope fitted itself to Mrs. McNabb's eyes, and in a ring of light she saw the old gentleman, lean as a rake, wagging his head, as she came up with the washing, talking to himself, she supposed, on the lawn. He never noticed her. Some said he was dead. Some said she was dead. Which was it? Mrs. Bass didn't know for certain either. The young gentleman was dead. That she was sure. She had read his name in the papers. There was the cook now, Mildred, Marion, some such name as that a red-headed woman, quick-tempered like all her sort, but kind, too, if you knew the way with her. Many a laugh they had had together. She saved a plate of soup for Maggie. A bite of ham, sometimes. Whatever was over. They lived well in those days. They had everything they wanted, glibly, jovially, with the tea hot in her, she unwound her ball of memories, sitting in the wicker armchair by the nursery fender. There was always plenty doing, people in the house, twenty staying sometimes, and washing up till long past midnight. Mrs. Bast, she had never known them. Had lived in Glasgow at that time, wondered, putting her cup down, whatever they hung that beast's skull there for. Shot in foreign parts no doubt. It might well be, said Mrs. McNabb, wantoning on with her memories. They had friends in eastern countries. Gentlemen staying there, ladies in evening dress. She had seen them once through the dining room door all sitting at dinner. Twenty she dared say all in their jewelry, and she asked to stay help wash up, might be till after midnight. Ah, said Mrs. Bast, they'd find it changed. She leaned out of the window. She watched her son George scything the grass. They might well ask, what had been done to it? Seeing how old Kennedy was supposed to have charge of it, and then his leg got so bad after he fell from the cart. And perhaps then no one for a year, or the better part of one. And then Davy MacDonald, and seeds might be sent, but who should say if they were ever planted? They'd find it changed. She watched her son scything. He was a great one for work one of those quiet ones. Well they must be getting along with the cupboards, she supposed. They hauled themselves up. At last, after days of labor within, of cutting and digging without, dusters were flicked from the windows, the windows were shut to, keys were turned all over the house. The front door was banged. It was finished. And now as if the cleaning and the scrubbing and the scything and the mowing had drowned it there rose that half-heard melody, that intermittent music which the ear half catches but lets fall. A bark, a bleat. Irregular, intermittent, yet somehow related. The hum of an insect, the tremor of cut grass, dice veered yet somehow belonging. The jar of a door beetle, the squeak of a wheel, loud, low, but mysteriously related which the ear strains to bring together and is always on the verge of harmonizing, but they are never quite heard, never fully harmonized, and at last, in the evening, one after another the sounds die out, and the harmony falters, and silence falls. 
with the sunset sharpness was lost, and like mist rising, quiet rose, quiet spread, the wind settled. Loosely the world shook itself down to sleep, darkly here without a light to it, save what came green suffused through leaves, or pale on the white flowers in the bed by the window. Lily Briscoe had her bag carried up to the house late one evening in September. Mr. Carmichael came by the same train. End of Chapter 9 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 10 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf. Then indeed peace had come. Messages of peace breathed from the sea to the shore. Never to break its sleep any more, to lull it rather more deeply to rest, and whatever the dreamers dreamt holily, dreamt wisely, to confirm what else was it murmuring as Lily Briscoe laid her head on the pillow in the clean still room and heard the sea. Through the open window the voice of the beauty of the world came murmuring, too softly to hear exactly what it said but what mattered if the meaning were plain? And reading the sleepers, the house was full again. Mrs. Beckwith was staying there, also Mr. Carmichael, if they would not actually come down to the beach itself at least to lift the blind and look out. They would see then night flowing down in purple. His head crowned. His scepter jeweled. And how in his eyes a child might look. And if they still faltered, Lily was tired out with traveling and slept almost at once. But Mr. Carmichael read a book by candlelight, if they still said no, that it was vapor, this splendor of his, and the dew had more power than he, and they preferred sleeping. Gently then without complaint, or argument, the voice would sing its song. Gently the waves would break, Lily heard them in her sleep. Tenderly the light fell, it seemed to come through her eyelids. And it all looked, Mr. Carmichael thought, shutting his book, falling asleep, much as it used to look. Indeed the voice might resume, as the curtains of dark wrapped themselves over the house, over Mrs. Beckwith, Mr. Carmichael and Lily Briscoe so that they lay with several folds of blackness on their eyes, why not accept this, be content with this, acquiesce and resign? The sigh of all the seas breaking in measure round the isle soothed them. The night wrapped them. Nothing broke their sleep, until, the birds beginning and the dawn weaving their thin voices into its whiteness, a cart grinding, a dog somewhere barking, the sun lifted the curtains, broke the veil on their eyes, and Lily Briscoe stirring in her sleep. She clutched at her blankets as a faller clutches at the turf on the edge of a cliff. Her eyes opened wide. Here she was again, she thought, sitting bold upright in bed. Awake. End of chapter 10, and, end of part 2 of, To the Lighthouse, by Virginia Woolf.